an ode to book maps. The first book map I remember discovering as a child took me on a journey across medieval Europe. Many adventures followed, from idyllic future societies to realms filled with dragons and sometimes despair. Nothing compares to the feeling of opening a new book and seeing those rivers, mountains, forests, and faraway lands for the very first time. Look out for the compass, which will guide you on your way and make sure you never get lost. I've revisited my favorite maps many times, retracing the paths with my finger, and have found new details I'd never seen before. Next time you meet a new book map, spend a few extra moments with it before setting off on a new journey. Hoi, in case you're new here, my name is Sana, and that was my ode to book maps. It's an idea that I'd been toying with for quite a while and I just wanted to spend a whole video geeking out about maps and world building. Just take some time to truly appreciate them. You can't see this right now, but there is a ginormous stack of books next to me. I think if I stack them all up, they might just come to my height. But I basically went through my shelves and found all the books with maps. So also definitely stick around if you are looking for some fantasy recommendations. Before I get into this stack of books and potentially topple it over, I actually have such a fun sponsor for today's video as well that I want to share with you. And hopefully it will be a really fun discovery for those of you who write your own fantasy stories or enjoy building worlds if you're working on games or if you play D&D. So they're called World Anvil and they are a world building website and community. It's a place where you can go and create and organize, very importantly, your world settings. World Anvil is run by a small team of two. They're so enthusiastic about it. I had a lovely video call with them where they talked me through everything. So how it works is that you can go on the website and you can create articles that are all linked together similar to Wikipedia and you can also build timelines and family trees and if you've got a map you can turn it into an interactive map with pins and descriptions and things like that. You can also use it to keep track of your notes if you're writing something that has a lot of historical details and research you can use it to keep track of it that way or of course you can build your own world from scratch. And one of the things that I loved about it so much is that there is an active community, there's 1.5 million people around the world that use it and they're all gamers, writers, world builders so everyone's very like creative and helpful together. There's a discord chat where you can ask for help, there's lots of tutorials on YouTube of which I've watched quite a few and in July they're also running a world building summer camp which has lots of prompts so if you're looking to get started with world building and you're not sure how to go about it, that is a fun and creative way to start as well. So World Anvil is free to use and you get all the major functions, but you can also upgrade to a paid membership and become a guild member. And I think that's especially helpful if you're working on a book because you get extra features like creating a private world and there is also novel writing software in there and it has lots of the features you'd expect like having different chapters and moving things around and color coding, but it also means that you can pull up all the information like timelines, notes, articles while you are writing so you can like access your own research very easily. So that is World Anvil. I thought that would be a very appropriate sponsor for this video. And they've also given me a discount code, Books and Quills, if you want to get a guild membership. But I'll put a link in the description, so definitely go check that out. And also, obviously, if you make anything, please do share it with me. I'd love to see it. I've had lots of fun scrolling around and looking at other people's like timelines and interactive maps and things like that. I'm gonna do a cliche thing and start with the dictionary definition, but it's not coming from Webster's Dictionary. It's coming from Wikipedia. Wikipedia says, world building is the process of constructing an imaginary world, sometimes associated with a whole fictional universe. When I was on the wiki page for world building, I immediately thought back to one of my literature courses. I can't remember which one it was, but I guess we were discussing fantasy and sci-fi, but the professor was talking about the idea that it is basically impossible to make up a world that is entirely new because everything both by the writer and when the reader is reading it, always has to be in, in context of our earth and I guess of our culture. So you're always describing things as it's not 
like it is here or it is like it is here and there's basically no way to totally separate yourself because that's obviously what we're living in. Quick run through of some of my favorite childhood maps first. They are all Dutch books that mostly haven't been translated so I won't go very deep into the world building because unless you can read Dutch you can't read these but they really either determined my taste or I already was into this and then these books just you know, fell into that genre? I don't know. I want to start with this one, which I've mentioned before. It's called Children of Mother Earth by Thea Beckman, Kinderen van Moeder Aarde. And this has a map in the front of Greenland, but in the future, after a third world war, a nuclear war that has tilted or like reversed the poles. So Greenland becomes inhabitable and it is now a, a matriarchal society called Tule. All these books are quite old. Oh yes, yeah, so this was written in 1985. I guess that's around like the 80s. I think it's also when The Handmaid's Tale was written. You start out in this like new Greenland, but it turns out that Europe has also started to rebuild, but they are sort of back in the time of the industrial revolution and they're kind of destroying all of nature. And then they discover that Greenland is there and they all get in a big boat and, and go over there and conflict ensues. It was just the first time I'd ever read about any of those concepts. So I read all of these books between probably the ages of eight, nine to maybe 12, 13. They just blew my little mind. A lot of these books were also historical books and they would just have maps of like old Europe in it. So this is Crusade in Jeans by Thea Beckmann. This is a map of like medieval Europe on it. And again, that was something that as a child, I probably hadn't considered that much. I was always surprised that this book, Koning von Katora by Jan Terlau, which is the king of Katora, was never translated because um, this is kind of a fairy tale like story. There is this magical realm and there's all these quests that a young boy has to go on in order to become the king of Katoren. And this map actually does so much more than just show different places because it does show all the sort of challenges that he has to go through and if you see this map without having read the book, that is just such a way to draw in a young reader. Side note, fun translation difficulty. In Dutch, a pomegranate is called a granaat apple or a grenade apple. So there was this tree, I'm pretty sure it's been 20 years since I read this, uh, that had grenade apples on it. Um, that So pomegranates, but they were actual bombs. Okay, the next map is a winner. It's not a fantasy world, but it's a post-apocalyptic map of the Netherlands. Now that is something you don't get to see that much because I feel like there's not that much genre fiction in the Netherlands. I'm sure there's some, but there's not that much. So this feels very unique. So this is called No One Can Stop Me by Evert Hartmann, Niemand Houdt Mij Tegen, an adventure in the 22nd century. I love this map. I hope it's not, you know, a vision of things to come. So it's a map of the Netherlands, but half of the Netherlands has flooded because of climate change. I think, I think it's because of climate change. And since the town that I lived in was uh, just about here, that also really captured the imagination. My parents' house is a few meters below sea level. It also has the map in the back just so you can access it twice, I'm not sure why. That's a map that I always remember. There's a lot of really interesting other stuff in this. Again, I haven't reread this in about 15 years. Worth a reread for a further discussion. Okay, let's get into some English language books that you will also be able to read. And besides, you know, just enjoying the maps, I also wanted to think about for each of these stories out of the ones that I've read, what is it about the world building that I find so special. Looking at the books that I want to talk about and kind of my own interpretation of it, I would say some of the different aspects could be magic, like the magic system, history, some world building obviously very heavily relies on history, culture slash countries, politics and the way society works, you know, some of these blend together a little bit. And then things like biology or species. So maybe when you're talking sci-fi and there being lots of different like species and, and kinds of creatures, aliens might be one of the big talking points. And I also wrote down lore, which kind of felt more like the sort of magical traditions or the, the stories that get passed on. So maybe a combination of like magic, 
history and culture. Of course, I was curious what some of you might think about book maps and what your favorite books were. So I asked, what is your favorite book with a map in it? And not surprisingly, one of the main answers was Lord of the Rings. I do own, I think over there, I own some copies of Lord of the Rings. I love the films. I don't think I'll ever read the books. I'm not sure if it's for me, but that of course was a big answer. And then the other two were like the Grishaverse, Six of Crows, Shadow and Bone, and then Aragon, of course. Okay, I'm gonna start with an old, old familiar. I have a few editions of this book in this series actually, and I initially read them as an ebook, uh, but it is the Old Kingdom series by Garth Nix. Oh yes, I'm talking about it again. So I have the new UK edition, although I think they're doing another series potentially. They're bringing out like the classic like 20th anniversary edition. And then this is the Australian edition, which I had especially shipped over all the way from Australia. I loved the illustrations on it, although the, uh, the new covers in the UK are very cool as well. I bought this quite a while ago. So I'll use this one as an example. So here we've got, this has a lot of good like world building stuff in the illustration. So we have all the necromancy bells. And then here's kind of like a zoomed in version of the map. And then there is the full map here, which is, oh, I don't actually know how to pronounce it. Ancelstier. I think that's how I've been saying it, which is the, uh, the non-magical world. And then the old kingdom, which is the magical world. And there is a neat wall in between. The story is about um, a young girl who is currently at school in the sort of non-magical world. And she gets, it's been a while since I've read it, like a vision or a dream of her father saying you have to come home or you have to come help me so she has to travel back up and then take over from her father and and learn this magic it's basically to help keep creatures that should be in the realm of death keep them there and make sure they don't pass into the human world two big highlights of world building for me in this series are definitely the magic system, it's like a current that runs through everything. The bells that have to be used so carefully and it's like such an art to learn how to do it because you ring it wrong and you know, everyone around you is dead. But then also when they go into death and death is like a river and there's different levels to it. So you keep moving further and further into death and as you're standing in the river, all you want to do is, is lay down and just glide away. But there's lots of, creatures lingering in there and it's used very sparingly which i appreciate they don't go into death that often but when they do it's a very special moment and across the books there is also like a royal family and history and things like that but yeah i think the magic for me is a real standout in this series and in case you hadn't heard it yet there is also a new book in the series coming soon this year next year soon fifth season i'm reading at the moment i had originally read like this far into it and then i've swapped to the audiobook and i've gone from the beginning again and it's actually really nice to kind of get the initial bit of like world building and things like that from the beginning in a previous video i've read the opening bit that goes like this is the way the world ends this is the way the world ends for the last time let's not hurry let's look at the map first so we've got the stillness I haven't actually looked at this map properly since having now read, I think like 40% of the book. The Arctic's at the top. There's the minimal plate, the maximal plate, because the like, I guess earth plates are very important. Uh, oh, tecton tectonic plates. This is quite a sparse map, not that many cities on it and things like that, which also, you know, that's part of the story. The way that you get introduced into this story is that you meet several characters. They're all on different journeys. They are origins. I think that's what it's called. It's hard to remember like new names and new things when you're listening to the audiobook, but they're basically, I guess, a species that can connect with the earth and they are feared, they're killed, they're also exploited. They're also trained. There's a few different characters traveling around and different stories that you're following, but mostly there is like an earth shattering earth ending event that it begins with but there's a lot of introductions by an all-knowing character narrator we don't know exactly who it is yet who's kind of setting the scene for what is happening and then you dive into the individual stories i think it does a really good job of explaining the different concepts it doesn't really spell it out but it does you know take you along the way and i think what i find the most compelling about this besides just the incredible writing is that bit of like lore where you find out sort of the common history of these origins and, and how people have perceived them 
and how they teach each other and how they relate to each other. Then again, the, the stories that they tell about themselves and things that maybe they don't know about their history. Okay, these are quite fun maps to show. So this is one I haven't read yet. I still don't know if I will read this, but it is The Extinction Trials, which is like The Hunger Game meets Jurassic Park. And of course, it's got a map, but it's the map of the world that, you know, that like The Hunger Games takes place in. So that's where they get brought. So it's just like dinosaurs. There's Blaine's shack, and then there is uncharted territory, and there's a megalodon um, somewhere in the ocean. This really cracked me up when I started reading and looking at this map, so I wanted to share that. This is a more recent read for me. It is Wranglestone, and it is set in a post-apocalyptic Canada or America? I'm gonna say America, where people are taking refuge from a zombie apocalypse in the national parks. Zombie apocalypse wasn't in the national parks, that's where they're taking refuge. And they all live around this lake, which offers protection during the summer. But this is such a lovely map on like a quite a small scale, because this just has like the different little islands and the different houses where people live. There is like Wranglestone Falls and the boathouse and all these locations that you come across. And it's quite nice to be able to see it on a map like this, which also shows that a map can be really on like any scale. And what I loved most about this book were the interpersonal relationships and the way they had set up this like quite small community and how they were trying to keep the peace and survive. The zombies were obviously a very interesting part of it, but this kind of community aspect definitely I felt was um, for me like the strongest pull. Another quick mention of books that have maps that I hadn't even thought about the fact that they had maps. We Were Liars by E. Lockhart has a little map of the island. This is another just case of setting the scene, like making sure that you know what's on the island. But the most helpful thing here is that it basically has a family tree within the map that might be its main purpose. While I was digging through my collection of books, I also came across a few that I was 100% convinced would have maps in it, including this one, A Winter's Promise, which I haven't read yet. It's translated, it's the first in a trilogy, and I thought, surely this has a map, and it does not. And now maybe there's not enough traveling around or sort of like world chat to warrant a map, but especially a book with such a beautifully illustrated cover, um, very much surprised me. If you've read this, let me know why there's not a map in here. And then a book that has inspired many, many fan-drawn maps, including one that I've made myself, which I have as a video note from like 2009. I was like, I should make a video about this fan map that I've drawn. It's of course The Hunger Games. I'm very, very surprised that there's not a map in it. Like I knew there wasn't a map in it, but it would have made sense. And I think the first time that I realized that Pan Am was supposed to be like in the place where the United States is. Blew my mind a little bit, but yeah, I've seen so many fan draw maps of all the different districts. World building wise for this one, I think it is just the way that the society works. And again, that's probably gonna be the way with a lot of dystopian books. You want to know what's happening in politics. What are the rules? What's the setup? How did it come to be like this? But yeah, I think that's, probably the obvious draw for this one. Then finally ending with some that I've pulled off my shelves that I haven't read yet. And for some of these I actually went out and got a finished copy because I had a proof copy before and proof copies mostly don't come with the maps. So we've got those side by side, so no map in this one. The author of Ray Bearer is a Nigerian American writer. And for this one, I've actually listened to the first chapter of the book and it is one hell of a first chapter. But I haven't had a proper look at the uh, the map yet. So interestingly, this mostly has icons and what looks like names of districts. So it doesn't give that much away. I'll read you the first and last sentence of the first chapter. So chapter one, I shouldn't have been surprised that fairies exist. The last sentence of the first chapter is, my mother was the devil and I her puppet demon. So in the like, eight pages of the first chapter, this book has already done a lot. But again, not in an overwhelming way, but it's just, it's a, it's a brilliant setup, but also in a way that basically gives me no idea of what's going to happen next. So I'm excited to be surprised. Next, The Priory of the Orange Tree. Also mentioned a lot by people on Instagram, of course. Proof copy, 
no map. I actually tried to buy a hardback because I'm not super keen on paperbacks for really big books, but no longer available because the paperback is out. I mean, if your book has dragons, it has to have a map in it, right? That must be the rules. This one actually has quite a bit of detail. We've got kingdoms, free states, draconic kingdom, and there is also a second map. Finally, of course, we've got the Grisha first books. Well, I got um, Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. I didn't own these before. Again, I'm also listening to the audiobook for this, but all the American audiobook narrators are pronouncing the Dutch inspired names in the worst kinds of ways. So I might just have to read the physical instead. So this is the like Grisha verse map with the Unsea and Kerch, which is where Keter Dam is. In Six of Crows, you don't get a Keter Dam map. So maybe that isn't in Six of Crows. I don't know that much about it yet. I've only watched the series. Got a map, like a drawing of the ice court. But what I was really interested in was the map of Keter Dam, inspired by Rotterdam or Amsterdam. But as someone who's from the Netherlands, of course, this interests me. It's very fun to see. It's got like, quite a detailed legend as well. Knowing that this was an aspect of these books is definitely one of the things that has drawn me in. I think I've gone through all the books. I'm sure there's a few more books with maps hiding in my shelves. These are the ones I wanted to share with you. If you have any other favorites, do let me know. Also curious, of course, which one of the books that I haven't read you think I should read first. And I hope you enjoyed this little moment of just appreciating the existence of book maps and magical worlds. Thanks so much again to World Anvil for sponsoring this video. Taking on sponsorships with cool companies like this is also what enables me to spend more time on making videos. So definitely go check out their amazing world building platform and cool community in the description. That's it for me. I'm gonna try and restore my shelves to their uh, original glory and I'll talk to you later. Doey!